bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book born and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide, tis a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing this blessing divine. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad for the word of God? Amen. Folks, we have a freedom in our country that not all countries have. What a wonderful blessing it is to be able to own a copy of the Word of God, be able to bring it with you to the house of God, and hear the Word preached from the man of God. Yes, Folks, that's a privilege not everybody on this planet has. And I think so oftentimes we take it for granted. Now on Sunday mornings we're preaching through the book of Matthew. I want you to open your Bibles this morning with me to the 21st chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday morning. And we're going to pick up now, <clears throat> remind you that Jesus, excuse me, had uh, ridden into Jerusalem on Sunday at the triumphal entry. He had Monday, he'd gone back and cleansed out the temple. And Tuesday now he's back. And in the city, this is the final week of his life as a man on planet earth. By the end of this week, he will have been crucified and his body would have been placed in a tomb. And here we are after cleansing the temple. And Jesus is now talking with the religious leaders in verse 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will in like wise tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned within themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, Go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he said, answered and said, I go, sir. Matter of fact, if you'll notice that little word G-O is italicized. It means it was supplied by the translators for clarification. Literally translated. He said, I, sir. Now, you guys around here get that, don't you? Aye, aye, sir, I'm, I'm going, and went not. Whether of the two of them did the will of his father, they say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you. Now who's he speaking to? The 20, verse 23, he's speaking to the chief priest and the elders of the people. Mark and Luke's account also add that the scribes are there. So he's speaking to the chief priest, the scribes, and the elders of the people. And he says, I say unto you, all you religious people, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. I almost named the sermon, right? Harlots get to go to heaven first. But I didn't. But that's what Jesus said, is it not? Verse 32, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. Now, we're going to preach through the end of the chapter, but I will stop our reading there for, right now for this morning. Now, I do want to speak to you on the subject of don't let your religion keep you out of heaven. And that's exactly what these folks were doing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, 
Pray that you'd add your blessings now to the reading, the preaching of your word this morning. Thank you for the thoughts you've given me now. I pray that I might honor you by communicating what you've laid on my heart, what you've given me in my study, and what you've allowed me to prepare. I pray that it would go out with power, not my power, but yours. I pray, Lord, that it would challenge our hearts, and we pray that if there's anyone here this morning that is depending upon a religious experience that they had of getting them into heaven, help them to understand that doesn't get it. I pray that we would all understand that nothing that we do religiosity, none of our religiosity, none of our religious trappings, none of our religious adornments have any merit at all for getting us into heaven. And I pray, Lord, that you're blessed now in the time of preaching this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It was about a little over a year ago when we had the, the unfortunate duty of burying one of our beloved members and, uh, uh, and uh, Gary Silva. And we have missed Gary over the past almost year and a half now. Uh, he was a great asset and a great blessing in this ministry. Gary had been saved 10 years earlier out of the Catholic Church. And um, after the funeral was all said and done, uh, his former priest and a couple of family members came to visit me. And uh, because the priest was a little distraught that I had not permitted him to have a part in the funeral service. Well, obviously, you know, that, that just wouldn't work. And um, the priest began to recite to me all of the things that had happened to Gary as he was a young infant and growing boy. He was an altar boy. He had been gone through catechism and he had been baptized and all this stuff. And I looked at the man and I said, well, sir, not any of that has anything to do with getting him into heaven where he is now. Well, when I said that, this priest stood up, slammed the table, and began to curse. And as I was preparing this message, I could not help but think of that experience because here Jesus is standing before a bunch of religious people. They've got all the trappings. They've got all the adornments. They've got been all the rites and the rituals. They've done the circumcisions and all of these things, these rites, these rituals, which some might call sacraments. They were doing them all. And they thought that that somehow merited entrance into heaven. But Jesus is dealing straight for, for, straightforward with these people these people here and the, the verses 33 through 46 at the end of the chapter he tells a story about a vineyard we'll get to in a minute but both of these stories are about vineyards and they all come off this question that they ask him in verse 23 but what authority do you do these things and who gave you that authority this whole account is precipitated by the event of the cleansing of the temple that Jesus had done in verses 12 and following there that uh, there in chapter 12 of Matthew where he had gone in. He had not asked to sit down and have a meeting of the council and say, guys, I'm really not really impressed with what you're doing here in the temple at all. I don't think it's wise. I don't think it's the best thing. I think you ought to reconsider what you're doing. He didn't ask to see the bylaws or the constitution. He didn't ask to see any of that. He went in with absolute authority. He began to clean house. He said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a house of merchandise. You have corrupted the very reason it exists. And he walked in, he cleaned house for the second time in his ministry on earth that he did that. And now then, the Pharisees and that, he had, um, that he had dealt with, the scribes and the elders are all here, the chief priests, and they look at him and say, wait a second. And if I could put it in modern vernacular, just who do you think you are? walking in and doing such a thing in our temple. Who, by what authority do you do those things and who gave you that authority? Well, in these ensuing verses and chapters that we're going to see over the next couple of chapters of Matthew, it begins a question and answer period back and forth between Jesus and the religious leaders. And it wasn't because they were seeking information. It's because they were trying to trap him up. Remember, he is now just days away from being crucified on a cross. Remember, he is almost at the point that he came to the earth, planet Earth for. He's almost at that pl place where sacrificing himself for the sin of the world. 
And so now then, something he had avoided up to now. He did most of his ministry up in Galilee. He did very little ministry down in Jerusalem. Because it, he was, as, as John, the writer in John's gospel, kept reminding us, mine hour is not yet come. Well, now his hour is come. He has come into Jerusalem and with full authority of being God Almighty, he goes in and cleans the temple and he does that and he begins a chain reaction, as it were, of them trying to trap Jesus up in his words. And we're going to see that over the rest of chapter 21, chapter 22, and into chapter 23. And they're going to have lawyers there trying to trap him. And so it, become, it becomes a con confrontational event in the life of Jesus Christ. Yet these verses we see the Lord masterfully dealing with the entire situation. Now let me ask you a question. You say, how does this apply to me, preacher? Well, have you ever been in a place in your life where people tried to use your words against you? Amen. How do you deal with them? I think the master set the best example to do that. Amen? Amen? So I want you to notice, and we're going to see three things in the text before us, and we're going to cover all the way to the end of the chapter uh, uh, as we do this. But I want you to notice, first of all, the expelling of their inquiry. The expelling of their inquiry. What, what I mean, Jesus will quickly dismiss their question because it would serve no purpose to answer it. So that's why he's going to say the expelling of their inquiry. He's getting rid of it. They come to him and ask him the question. It's a twofold question. By what authority do you do it? And who gave you the authority? Notice the intention of the question. First of all, after having observed this, they come back and they ask him, who do you think you are? Like I said, Jesus had entered the temple and just taken absolute control. But what they were trying to do was trap Jesus. In other words, they believe. They believed that with such a question they would have him trapped. Why is that? Because if Jesus said, well, I didn't really have any authority to do it, then he might lose the respect of the people and they would win. But if he said, I do it by the authority of God Almighty, then they could accuse him of blasphemy, which was their point. So either way, they saw it as a win-win situation. He would either lose respect to the people or he would lose his life to them. One of the two. And Jesus, the last verse of John chapter 2 tells us he knows what's in the heart of man. Yeah. And so Jesus was too wise and Jesus was too omniscient to fall prey to their deceitfully laid word trap, as it were. That's what Jesus did. He did what was a classical response of the time. He answered a question with a question. He said, all right, let me ask you a question. You answer it, I'll answer yours. The, so the intent of the question was to trap Jesus, but notice the reaction to the question. As Jesus, being the master of every situation, answered the question, he was not avoiding the question. It simply wasn't time that was several days down the road before he was to be put to death. Jesus knew what they were doing. So he asked the question, now, he said, the baptism of John, was it of heaven or was it of men? Now, it's a simple question, but why did Jesus ask that? Because, again, they had asked a question on what authority they did that. Jesus was tying himself directly back to John. Because it was John who had looked at him in John 1, 29 and said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. It was him who said in John 3, 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. John had acknowledged the authority. And so Jesus was simply saying, It doesn't matter what I answer here. You rejected John. You're going to reject me. Right. And so what happened was Jesus asked him, was it a heavenly baptism or was it of men? And of course, all of a sudden, that took the, these guys back. It's almost comical because if you notice as we read while I go, they begin to reason within themselves. Now, can I tell you what that means? They're all here. They're all here as a group. They're here amongst the crowd. They've got Jesus cornered. They ask him the question that's about to nail his coffin shut in their minds. And he turns around there. And all of a sudden, with one question, he turns the tables on them. And they go, come here, guys. All right, now, we got to, what are we going to do now? We're in a trap. Boy, that's a Bible principle. 
Paul, uh, Proverbs talks about he that rolleth the stone upon another, it will return upon him. You know, what you sow is what you reap. And here, the, here are these chief priests and the elders, they're all here. They just got nailed. They said, now we're in the no-win situation. If we say it's from heaven, he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe me? Why didn't you believe him? If we say it's a man, then the people are going to hate us because everybody thinks John the Baptist was one of the greatest. So they decided to lie. And they said, well, we can't tell. Now, that's a hypocritical answer. Why do I say that it was a hypocritical answer? Because it was their job, it was their job to be able to spot religious or spiritual imposters, the fakes, prophets, and so forth. They should have been able to say. And yet Jesus did not defend his position at all. He did not defend his authority at all. He simply turned the tables back on them. I like what Ivor Powell, Powell in his commentary on the subject said. He said, preachers and teachers should learn from the Lord's example here. Basically, they need not defend the gospel nor answer questions designed to baffle ministers. Spurgeon once said, there is never a need to defend a lion. Simply let the lion out of its cage and the beast will defend itself. Amen. Similarly, we, hardly, we are hardly commissioned to defend the message of Christ. Our job is to preach it and God is capable of looking after his own affairs. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He did not, he just simply let the lion out and turned the tables on them. And to me, it's such a masterful way of the way Jesus handled that situation. If he had been like me or like you or like most of us, he would have had a reactionary response. Boy, when people question what we do, does it put you on the defensive? Does it, boy, it automatically, it automatically gets you ready to argue and ready, ready to debate. Jesus didn't fall prey to any of that. By the way, do you understand that's how the devil trips a lot of us up? People will question what we do or why we do, and the next thing you know, we're ready to we're ready to beat them down. We're ready to put them in their place. That is not a Bible response. Amen. That's not the that's not the way the Lord responded, was it? And Je by the way, Jesus could have simply spoken in such a way that every one of them would have dropped at his feet. You know, later on in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers come. And he says, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He said, I am. And they all fell down. He could have done the same thing with the chief priest, but he didn't do that. What I'm trying to simply say, if we're, gonna, if we're going to be effective witnesses and testimonies, we've got to learn to respond like the Savior responded. If anybody had a right to put them in their place, Christ did here. He simply asked them a question. And they were put in their place. That's being wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as Jesus told his disciples to do. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty sophisticated of, of the Lord, but what a blessing. So I want you to look at number two, though, in verses 28 through 32. Look at the exposing of their hypocrisy. We talked about the expelling of their inquiry. Now look at the exposing. Of, and so Jesus uses, he continues. It, matter of fact, this parable about the two sons is all about their belief or non-belief about John because he mentions it again in verse 32. Now, here's the story. Here's the stating of the parable. Jesus immediately begins to drive home the, the, the point of their hypocrisy. He tells about two sons. The father comes to both of them and says, go work in my vineyard today. The first one says, I am not going. Later, though, he has a change of heart. He repents for his disobedience, and he goes and does it. The second one says, I, right, sir, on the way. And he never goes. And Jesus simply asked them, which of the two did the will of the Father? Without realizing it, I don't, without realizing it, they quickly responded, the first. They had just identified themselves as the non-obedient, non-believing second son. Because Jesus explains, there's no need, and I was reading different commentaries and so forth, doing some study, there's no need to allegorize this particular parable and say, well, this means this. No, Jesus exactly says what it means. Look at the meaning of the parable. Notice what happens here. The, the first one, he said, is like the publicans 
and harlots. They were, they had heard the message somehow, some way, and they had not responded. They went about their evil lifestyle, their sinful lifestyle. But they heard John the Baptist. They heard John's message and they repented. How do we know that? Hold your finger there and look with me in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, where John is baptizing. Luke chapter 3. So we find in, John, in Luke chapter 3, John is baptizing in verse 3. He's preaching and baptizing at the, at the river Jordan. He's giving the message of flee from the wrath to come and talking about salvation. Verse 10, And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and saith to him, them. He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, but he and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also the publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. Now we all know the publicans were the IRS of the day. They were the tax collectors. And they were known not so differently as ours, they were known for their dishonesty, deceit, and treachery. That's what they were known for. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. We remember him? Once he got saved, he said, I'm going to restore everything I, missed, I, I dishonestly took. Plus, um, I'm going to restore sevenfold. I'm going to make it good. And the publicans had came. They had heard the message. Harlots came and heard the message and repented and believed. And the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, had heard the very same message, but it had not caused them to repent and believe. Because they were clinging to their religion. They were clinging to their ritualistic practices and their praying and their fasting and the circumcision and the feast that they observed and, and the law that they kept and the phylacteries that they wore, wore around their head to keep scripture tucked in and all of those things. And they thought that merited something, but it did not. I like what one writer said. He, he said, the religious leaders of the Jews, men who were deemed to be well at home in God's law, and outwardly behaved in such a manner as if they were constantly saying, yes, Lord, we will do what thou requirest of us, and we will go where thou dost want us to go. But they, do, they did not do, and they did not go. And even the conversion of the publicans and prostitutes through his preaching had failed to change their minds and hearts. They were like the second son, therefore. Another writer continues, the religious leaders appeared to be consecrated people, but were not. The publicans and sinners and harlots appeared to be sinful, and thus they were. But their desire for sin was destroyed by devotion to the Savior. The teaching of Christ was almost revolutionary, for he taught realities. God was concerned only with what men were. Holiness was better than theological precepts. Repentance was far more to be desired than empty profession. The law taught man's actions. The law taught that man's actions were paramount, but Christ said a man's character was more important. And boy, there's a message that our churches today need to hear, especially among fundamental Baptists, is that you know, I think standards and convictions are important and practicing living separated lives are important, but that is not what makes a person spiritual. Spiritual comes from within. It's who we are. I don't dress a certain way to make me spiritual. I dress a certain way because I am spiritual. My spiritual changes my dress. My dress don't change my spirituality. That's the way it is. It's supposed to be. Amen? Amen. And boy, how many lives have been ruined and wrecked because Pharisees and, and re religious leaders and fundamental churches have attached this list of things to that if you're not doing this, you can't be right with God. And there's no room for that. That's religiosity. Obviously, our church, we have convictions. We have separated practices. 
But we understand it's not to make us spiritual, but hopefully it's because our spirituality does that. And that's what Jesus was saying. These publicans, these harlots, harlot is just a, a Bible word for prostitute. That's what they were doing. And yet they got to go to heaven before this religious crowd did. You see, the expressing or the exposing of the hypocrisy. They thought they were somebody they weren't. And as I began the message while I go with the illustration of the priest that came by to see me, I felt sorry. I didn't get angry with the man. I felt sorry for the man. Because here's a man that is clothed with religiosity. Here's a man that has practiced religiosity and all the trappings that go with it for many years of his life. Thinking that they gave him favor before a holy God. And they don't. How sad that is. And yet there are people sitting in Baptist churches today that have maybe never drank, never smoked, never committed any of what we would consider the treacherous sins of our day. And thinking, I'm okay. No, you're not. Go to church. You carry your Bible. You dress a certain way. Okay, that's wonderful. But that don't give you merit to heaven. It has nothing to do with it. It expo simply exposes our hypocrisy. But thirdly, I want you to notice in verses 33 through 46, the portion of the text we've not yet read, I want you to notice the expressing of their iniquity. Let me just read through it, if I might. Here another parable, Jesus says in verse 33. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Now, let's just stop right there. Now, this one is full of allegory. This is full of pictures and types. If you want it out beside verse 33, write Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. That's a quotation from there. Because here in this story, this illustration, this parable, Israel is represented by the vineyard. The husbandmen are those religious leaders of the day that were left to be caretakers of the vineyard. The householder, obviously, is God himself. Verse 34, and when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husband. The servants, prophets of the past, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. Now, my son, obviously a representative of who? Jesus Christ. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? They say unto him, these are the religious people replying, the chief priests are replying, they say to him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which will, shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Let's just stop right there for the time being. Let me talk to you about the confrontation of the parable. As I said, Isaiah 5 tells us plainly that, I, that Israel is the considered the vineyard. Matter of fact, all through the Old Testament, Isaiah, uh, Israel is compared to the vineyard. And as I shared last week, compared to, compared to a fig tree in the vineyard, it's all there. So Jesus is continuing that analogy. And so he says, I let you out to the husbandmen, these men that were supposed to, these were sharecroppers. As a matter of fact, where it says, and built a tower and let it out to husband. That word, let, that phrase, let it out, it's one Greek word that simply means to lease out, like as to a shareholder. They farm it, they get to keep part of the crops, they share part of the crops back to the owner. So when the time of the fruits came nigh, he sent some servants, some prophets to the, and said, all right, give me what's due to me. 
And they stoned the prophet. They killed the prophets. They, they beat the prophets. And they literally did that all through the Old Testament. You read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was tortured and thrown into a dungeon and all kind of things. That was what happened to Jeremiah. And you have these people here and they, they kill him. And, the, and at that time you think, well, the landowner is going to go, he's going to give retribution. He's going to descend on them with wrath and, and take care of it. But no, he's a gracious landowner. And he says, maybe they didn't get it. I will send some more prophets. I will send some more servants. And he sent more and they got the same treatment. Last of all, he says, you think more at this time, man, he's bound to go wipe them out now. But then he does the unthinkable. He sends his son. He sends his son. Say, they will reverence my son. They'll show respect to my son. But they put him to death. Boy, do you see the picture here? And Jesus is very clearly telling this picture because he's about to die. The son is about to die. Just a few days from now. And Jesus is telling the picture, we said, God, I mean, Israel is the vineyard and you guys have been the husbandmen. You've been the caretakers of this thing. And you don't reverence God. You don't reverence anything he teaches you. You've not respected his prophets. John the Baptist is beheaded. The other prophets of old were beaten and tortured and put to death, many of them. And now I'm here and you rejected me. Now, what will the landlord do? And they spoke up instantly again. He will, just, he will come and destroy those wicked men, those miserable men. Boy, I almost, you have a flashback. Almost to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 where Nathan shows up. And Nathan is there telling the story. David, you won't believe this. This little boy, this man over here, just a poor man, had one sheep. Oh, and he loved it. They, they kept it in the house. And it was a kid's pet. And, and this other man who had dozens and herds of sheep and flocks. And he had a guest come in one night late. And he went over and took that one little man's sheep, his only sheep, that beloved sheep, and killed it. And David's fury enraged him. He said, who is this man? He shall be put to death for it. And Nathan, with the prophecy of God, said, Thou art the man. You almost hear that same thing ringing back here. He will put them miserable, wicked men to death. And you almost wonder why the Lord don't go, Thou art the man. He does in a roundabout way, though. Look at the next verse, verse 30, 42. Jesus said unto them, Now, you and I read this, and we read it ca too casually. Here's the question. Did you never read in the Scriptures? <laughs> Wait a second. Who's he talking to? See, we read that, and we go, well, yeah, he's just asking. No, that is a direct attack on their religiosity. <laughs> you preacher? Don't you read your Bible? I'm convinced a lot of preachers don't. And he says, don't you read the script? Haven't you read the scriptures? And he quotes Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has made the head of the corner. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Guys. Don't you, hadn't you read your scriptures that you claim to have read? You, I mean, they, they did. They were called phylacteries. They were, they were things, little, ba little leather bands that they would put, tie around their head, had little pockets on them here. And they'd keep scriptures, bit, tidbits of scripture tucked in there. It, it, it was supposed to be impressive to everybody who saw them. They said, well, those men really love the Word of God, don't they? He said, the Lord, is, the Lord is basically saying to him, have you ever taken one of those scriptures out and actually read it? The Lord was being almost sarcastic here, wasn't he? Did you never read in the scriptures? And then he quotes Psalm 118, verses 22 through 23. Now, you say, preacher, how is this coming home to us today? Here it is. Jesus said, you guys, you're right, verse 43. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. 
Now, by the way, there's right there where some of the what's called covenant theologians say, so what is that, preacher? There's a whole line of theology out there that says that Israel is no longer in the picture and every, all the promises God made to Israel now belong to the church in the New Testament and the church is the new Israel. And therefore there is no millennial period and, and so forth. Understand that is bad theology too. Because God still has a plan for Israel. That's the, by the way, the fact that God still has a plan this for Israel is the only explanation of why that little spot on the map is still over there. I mean, they, I watched the news this week, you know, and of course everything, this with Syria. I looked there and I told Kathy, I said, look at that tiny little spot there and all this massive map with all these enemies all around it. There's only one explanation why that little spot is still there. Amen. God's still got a plan for them. Right. Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, any other country would have been long gone by now. I mean, because they, I mean, just, I mean, here it is. Just a, I mean, it's just a little spot. I mean, compared to Syria, that just almost, I mean, it's amazing to me. Oh, it's the bright spot on the planet. You bet it is. And God says, but it's true. And for 2,000 plus years now, the church has been propagating the gospel. In verse 44, he says, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, and on whomsoever shall fall it will grind into powder. And simply saying, here it is, if I can paraphrase this, biblical truth. Biblical truth is crushing. It gets down to the heart of the matter, does it not? Now, I say here, here's the application for us today. Look at the last two verses. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. You duh, you think? But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the peop multitude because they took him for a prophet. Mark and Luke both tell us that they went, after they went away and began to conceive a plan. I'm paraphrasing it. On how they might get Jesus. Now here's how this all applies to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care where you are in life. You've been exposed, if you're here, and especially in this church, in the city of Columbus most likely, you have been exposed to the gospel. And we respond one of two ways. We either respond with repentance and belief like the prostitutes and the publicans, or we respond with hardness and religiosity and unbelief like the religious leaders of this, his day. I have witnessed to people that are so clinging, clinging to a religious experience they had. I think I've shared with you before, back in an earlier church I pastored, I went around visiting, when I first got there, went around visiting all the members of the church, visited a deacon of mine and the church, an elderly gentleman. An old farmer out on the farm went in and he had a big family and he had built a, a dining table that was about from here to the piano. They could sit about, I think, 15 at the, at the dining table. It was like a big picnic table, so like what, what it was. And we were sitting there talking one day, and I called him a name, and I said, tell me about the day you got saved. And he pointed out the window there out of the kitchen, that big picture window he had in his kitchen, and he said, well, preacher, see that fence out there? I said, yes, sir. He said, one day I was sitting here, and I had a cow and her calf were standing out there. And as I was looking at her, that calf began to glow. He said, I wonder what it was about. And right then, God told me I was okay. You know what? I never did get the man off that experience. And if that was the experience, that man is in hell today. I don't say that to be unkind. But he was, you say, well, that's a relig that was re ridiculous to believe in a glowing cow. Okay, a glowing cow or a baptism. Not any more ridiculous. Being baptized don't get anybody saved. It's a sign that you got saved. But it don't get you saved. Believing in a glowing cow or being a church member. How ridiculous is it thinking being a church member is going to get you into heaven? Amen. Amen. Or whether it be a glowing cow or uh, the fact that you've taught Sunday school for 20 years. No difference. 
they're both religious experience. I promise you, that man thought it was a religious experience he had that day. And as a result, the religious crowd will ultimately crucify the Savior. In just a few days from where he is there, let me ask you a question. What are you depending on? Have you heard the message and responded with repentance? And that, by the way, let me just... Let me just go back there just a minute. Repentance is a very essential part of salvation. You say, why are you saying this, preacher? I was in, I mean, I'm talking about independent Baptist churches are in arguments over this today. Whether or not repentance is required. Now, repentance, it means to have a change of mind. Metanoia is the word. It is, means to have a change of mind and attitude. It doesn't mean I'm forsaking everything I've ever done bad and won't ever do it again. No, we can't make promises like that. It simply means, though, that I agree with what God says about my sin. I agree with God. I was in a preacher's fellowship meeting where a man was preaching and he talked about the fact that there had to be repentance and a man in the congregation, another preacher, stood up in the middle of that preacher's meeting and began to blast him. Next thing I know it, there were preachers yelling and screaming at each other over the fact of repentance or not repentance. Let me tell you, if there hasn't been a time in your heart and you're in your life when the Holy Ghost of God convicted you of, a, of being a sinner against a holy God, and you quit trying to make it on your own and you changed your mind, you repented and agreed with God that what you were doing is wicked and sinful and wrong against a holy God of heaven and there's nothing you could do to get yourself there to heaven, and you place your faith in Him alone, unless that's happened to you, you didn't get saved. There has to be conviction. There has to be repentance. Those are not works. Those are attitudes. Those are things that we have to... Because till a person understands their lost and sinful condition, they will never come to Christ. Hardest thing to do sometimes is to... I, I talked to a man this week who doesn't see himself as lost. I can't get him to Christ. Till first of all, he's, he understands he's lost and without Christ. He thinks he's a good man. Okay, so did these guys. But unless they later repented and got saved, they died and went to hell, even though they'd been chief priest. What about you today? Let's bow our heads. In a moment, we're going to sing 667. Without him, I could do nothing. It's become one of my favorite invitational hymns because it so accurately states our condition. Without him, we can do absolutely nothing. You're here today, though, and you've not truly ever repented and trusted Christ. You don't know if you died this moment. You don't know that you'd go to heaven. Why on earth would you gamble your soul? Oh, don't do that. Leave with Jesus today. Let us show you how to know him. You say you're here today and you know you're saved. But you've got friends and family members and a co-workers who are depending upon some false religious experience they've had and you're burdened for them won't you come to this altar today Father you know the need of every heart I pray that you're blessed now in this time of decision and invitation in Jesus name Amen page 667 let's stand together